What's up to all my poets and Robert Bly fans out there? Today, I'm going to be doing a presentation and book breakdown on Robert Bly's leaping poetry. And the ability to leap as a poet is one of the most important and undervalued aspects of writing poetry. And today I'm going to be walking everyone through how to leap as a poet, what that entails, and some of the historical aspects of leaping and how it almost disappeared from poetry forever. So the technical definition of a leap is, quote, a jump from an object, object soaked in unconscious substance to an object or idea soaked in conscious su psychic substance. It's the association with language between the unconscious and the conscious and the leap from the unconscious to the conscious is where magic happens. That's where masterpieces are born. Beginner writers and in intermediate poets, they are using metaphors and similes, and those are leaps. But when you read them, they make at some level logic, logical or subjective sense. But the greatest poets of all time, they make leaps that have no merit in reality, logic, or subjective narrative or the subjective narrative, but at a psychic and intuitive level, they make sense and are beautiful. And you're like, how did they think of that? Those things are called leaps. And leaps have been a part of literature and art forever. If we return to the epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu and the relationship between them is a very is very leaping. We're leaping between the kingly light energy and the hairy man dark energy. All the great mother stories, stories that have a lot to do with the feminine. For instance, what did Circe do? Circe turned men into pigs. Leap. That's as from conscious to unconscious as you get. However, the leap started to diminish with the advent of the Abrahamic religions, of course, because the unconscious has to be rejected in those religions because the exploration of the unconscious in general is going to create actions, thoughts, and emotions that don't align with the vision of the religion and will eventually lead to its dismantling. Because the leap is associated to the animal instincts, the unconscious, you could say, has been the world's, is the world's greatest problem solver. It's been biologically evolving for millions of years. And this, the, the muladhara chakra, the lower base consciousness, being able to leap from the base to the crown chakra requires a very deep understanding of every chakra. And to put it in objective terms, you need to understand not just your will to power and you know how to be spiritual, but also how we are connected to animals and our instincts and all these different things. And those become a very important part of poetry. However, Christianity rejected that in a very black and white format, you know, good versus evil, light versus dark. And this has actually continued with the new religion of 2023, scientism. Most of the very logical types of the scientist types have no relationship with the unconscious because a relationship with the unconscious requires a very personal journey. I can teach you how to write better, to get better at you know, a certain sport that, you know, that I'm good at, but I can't teach you to explore your unconscious. That is the most personal journey of self-education and the most risky. I had a friend who I helped lead to the door and he walked through it. And when I knew him, I was doing martial arts with him every single day. He was my main training partner and he wanted to become a cop. And we started to hang out after we were done training. And I just, we talked about stuff. And eventually I started to give him books. And one day after reading enough and spending a bunch of time out in nature on his own, because I was like, yo, this is really good for like martial arts to clear your mind. He's had this major existential crisis and said, I'm, I'm moving away. I can't become a cop anymore. And I'm finally owning up to all this trauma from like early childhood. He was a foster child and like all this stuff happened to him. And he went down a crazy road for like two years and was in a very negative place. But now he's leaps and bounds beyond where he would have been if he never confronted all those things and just became a cop because he understands his unconscious at a very deep level. And he has the ability to jump from the conscious to the unconscious. So the revival of the of the unconscious after, you know, 1500 years of Christianity and the Abrahamic religions. And, and you could say that Beowulf, for instance, Beowulf has a lot of unconscious substance to it. So really, it was about a 700 year was romanticism and William Blake. William Blake was one of the first to really understand this idea. And a lot of times, he veiled it in, you know, very Christian terms, the songs of innocence and experience. Blake was really starting to play out with some of these ideas of dualism and the connection between that and the unconscious. And Blake, you know, William Blake is a master. And so we need ourselves to move away from the city, you know, the city within our mind and back out into the dark psychic woods, back into those zones that we really don't want to go into. Places maybe that haven't been inhabited by your ancestry for centuries, if not millennia. And so today, in today's presentation, I'm just really going to be walking you through some of the camps and some of the revival action that happened for 
you know, the leaping poets. We'll be examining some poems and talking about some of the poet, um, some of the poetry movements. So some of the greatest associators of all were the Spanish, uh, the Spanish in Spain and also in Central and South America. The Spanish symbolist movement is very well known for this. These are writers such as Antonio Machada, Lorca, Vallejo, even, you know, even moving into Pablo Neruda and others. And the Spanish started to, you know, found symbolism through Francis Charles Baudelaire. And Baudelaire was a symbolist, but the Spanish are just so good with the unconscious substance because the Spanish language, first of all, is very romantic. It's a very romantic culture. And then when we get to Central and South America, they were much closer to the unconscious substance. They were, in terms of their ancestry and their people and their customs, only a couple centuries at most removed from being very connected to that modality and with you know a tropic environment nature is ever present there you know weren't as much there wasn't as much urbanization happening so a lot of poets had the ability to be out in nature nature and to be in a very temperate environment where they can experience it all year if you're in germany six months out of the year you don't necessarily get to experience nature which is is one which is one of the best ways to really start to understand leaping and spanish really got into association when was the last time you heard an american poet talk about association so we're going to start, you know, um, hopping into the text now. So speaking of association, the, uh, the Spanish loved the new paths of association even more than the French. They considered them roads. Antonio Machado says, why should we call these accidental furrows roads? Everyone who moves on walk, everyone who moves on walks like Jesus on the sea. If we go down here, it doesn't matter now if the golden wine overflows from your crystal goblet or if the sour wine dirties the pure glass. You know the secret corridors, corridors of the soul, the roads that dreams take, and the calm evening where they go to die. And I really like this term down here, if you um, take a look at this, is that most people fall asso follow association railways. So the secret roads, the secret paths of the mind are where leaping takes place. But a lot of people use, you could that's what we could say tropes are, but they use these pathways that have already been built out, these jumps and leaps that people already know, they're not really moving outside the box. But to be unique requires you to make these leaps. And taking psychedelic substances or doing these things most of the time never helps. Most of the greatest leapers have actually been very sober and very calm individuals. It's not a very ecstatic thing. Sometimes it can be. Sometimes like... Kabir, for instance, was very good at making some of these leaps, and that is more rare than the kind of sober author who really contemplates language and is very mellow with it, mellow and relaxed, and then the leaps come. It's a very Taoistic kind of attitude. The Chinese mountain poets were insane at leaping. That's one of their main attributes. So now let's examine some of this Spanish leaping. And so we're going to start off with a poem by Juan Ramon Jimenez, and I will leave but the birds will sit, stay singing and my garden will stay with its green tree with its water well many afternoons the sky will be blue and placid and the bells in the belfry will chime as they are chiming this very afternoon the people who have loved, who have loved me will pass away and the town will burst anew every year but my spirit will always wander nostalgic in the stained recondite guard corner of my flowery garden. Or another one, let's see, by Jose Goritza. Oh, what blind joy, what hunger to use up the air that we breathe, the mouth, the eye, the hand. What biting itch to spend absolutely all of ourselves in one single burst of laughter. Oh, this impudent, insulting death that assassinates us from afar over the pleasure that we take in dying for a cup of tea, for a faint rest. So these are some, you know, some of the Spanish symbolists that were really starting to pack a punch in terms of modern American poetry. So once again, Americans missed this. Americans never really, and like, you know, we think of T.S. Eliot and Robertson Jeffers and all the American poets, we never have got into this type of Spanish association surrealist poetry because we were so caught up, first of all, in our own modernism, and a lot of these guys were never translated, almost never them, none of them were translated. And by the time they were by Robert Bly and others, John, you know, Berryman, Robert Lowell, the whole New York City poets and confessional poets, Sylvia Plath, all these different poets had come onto the scene and that had overtaken, that was a virus that had overtaken American poetry. And it still has to this day. And so unfortunately, that never happened. But 
there is another type of Spanish symbolism that is even deeper because if we look at a lot of these poets, they don't have that much emotional vigor behind their poetry because they weren't in that era yet. So if you look at, for instance, Rainer Marie Rilke and Marcel Proust on the literature side, they were the first to really start to understand the depths of our emotion, really under, start to explore them from that, you know, that modernist perspective. If you read Swan's Way by Proust, there are just pages and pages of a character describing a clock tower because it's starting to understand the deep emotional weight and psychic energy that we all have from just being conscious. And Lorca understood this on the side of poetry. And so Lorca started to describe this uh, phenomena, this idea of association and darkness as the Duende. And he has this really great essay. I recommend everyone check it out. It's called Theory and Function of the Duende, one of the great, great, great creative writing pieces out there. And he says that the Duende, very, Lorca says, quote, very often intellect is Poet is poetry's enemy because it is too much given to imitation, because it lifts the poet to a throne of sharp edges and makes him oblivious to the fact that he may suddenly be devoured by ants or a great arsenic lobster may fall on his head. And he's leaping right there, but it's true. When you were stuck in logic and you were taking what we were talking about, those pathways, those normal pathways of association, you never can be devoured by lobsters. None of these awakenings can happen. And it's very akin to Buddha. People ask the Buddha, are you a god? Are you a man? He said, no, I am awake. And in Eastern culture, there's this idea of the Satori, which is the instant awakening that these monks and these people out of nowhere would just understand almost everything or, you know, take themselves to the next level in terms of their monkhood or these things and these flash revelations. And as poets were looking for flash associations, it's much smaller. It's a lot easier to do, you know, having this mass revelation is hard, but to create these flash associations require us to be still though. It requires us to get rid of the chatter and start to search and examine the Duende. Coming back to the text, quote, Duende involves a kind of elation when death is present in the room. It is associated with dark sounds, and when a poet has Duende inside of him, he brushes past death with the, each step, and in that present associates fast. The gypsy flamico dancer is associating fast when she dances, and so Bach, and so is Bach when writing his cantas. Lorica mentions an old gypsy dancer who is hearing Barliski play Bach cried out, who on hearing Brailowski play Bach cried out, that has Duende. Lorca says, quote, to help us seek the Duende, there are neither maps nor discipline. All one knows is that it burns like blood, like powdered glass, that it exhausts, that it rejects all the sweet geometry one has learned, that it breaks with all styles, that it dresses with dresses the delicate body of Rimbaud in an acrobat's green suit, or that it puts the eyes of a dead fish on Count La Tremont in the early morning boulevard. The magical quality of a poem consists in its being always possessed by the Duende. So whoever beholds it is baptized with dark water. And even though it was kind of a joke there, Rimbaud in an acrobat, green acrobat suit, Rimbaud is one of the greatest Western leapers. Rimbaud, the talented young man, the talented young poet, who is not just leaping in his poetry, but leaping in his own personal life and living the lived experience, taking what a Herman Melville did, but even adding metaphor, story, and action into it. These are all aspects of the wild association. We cannot, we love as writers to think about craft and technique and theory and to do things time and time again, but we have to give up that sweet geometry. And this is what writers fall into all the time. This is why a lot of great writers, Don DeLittle, Stephen, Stephen King, they stopped getting better at some point. It's because they stopped, they tried to rely too long on that sweet geometry they learned and it became overused. You have to continue to search and be on edge with the Duende as an artist. And Bly here is just a peek in when he says, what is the opposite of wild association? Tame association, approved association, sluggish association, whatever we want to call it, we know what it is. That slow plodding association that pesters us in so many poetry magazines and in our own work when it is no good. Association that takes place half an hour, excuse me, that takes half an hour to compare childhood accidents to a crucifixion or a leaf to the I Ching. This is what happens. All, have you guys ever been there? Someone's trying to make this metaphor, make this connection. It's just droning on and on and on. And you just want to be like, shut the hell up, bro. Like, I, that's why I don't do workshops anymore. Like, 
at least when I'm editing people's work, like in my house and I'm like reading on screen, if it's like bad, at least I don't have to deal with hearing them and seeing them and like understand and then starting to give them a psychological evaluation and be like, why did you do this? Back to the text quote, poetry killed. Poetry is killed for students in high school by teachers who only understand this dull kind of association while their students are associating faster and faster. And as a young person, we associate fast. We have this ability. And the dumb stuff they show us in high school kills us. This is when they say they kill creativity. They are killing our ability to associate everybody. That is everything. That is contrast. That is metaphor. That is meaning, the, the ability to do this. That is why we are in an outcome-based education system. An outcome-based means that everyone ends up at the same place, learning the same thing. That is what the military does in religion. It creates this uniformity. And within uniformity, we do not have the ability to leap. Quote, the Protestant embarrassment in the presence of death turns us into muse poets or angel poets. Associating timidity, Lorca says, the duende. Where is the duende? Through the empty arch comes an air of the mind that blows incessantly over the heads of the dead in search of the new landscapes and uns unsuspected accents, an air smelling a child's saliva of pounded grass and medusal veil announcing the constant baptism of newly created things. Man, Lorca is firing on all cylinders there. And wild association, in my opinion, is associated with nature. Lorca once said, I only write in green so the animals can see it. And even though that's a joke, he's trying to say that poetry has its foundational roots in nature. And the only way we can get involved with nature is to treat it like any other relationship. How good of a relationship can you have with them, you know, your partner or your parents or whoever, if you never talk to them, if you talk to them very rare, rarely. And when you are out there, you're walking or doing something. How often do people just go sit in nation, sit in nature with no ambition at all? That is the key of Taoism, Lao Tzu, Chao Tzu. That, that's what they were doing. They were out there. That was That's their prescription. Go sit in nature and do nothing. And that changed my life when I started to do this. I went to uh, Utah State University, my first year of university, and there was this beautiful hill overlooking this beautiful valley in Utah, probably one of the most beautiful places in the United States. I would sit out there, rain, shine, snow, every single day for hours. And that changed everything. Because for a while, I felt like I was doing it because there was some goal at the end. But then I just started to do it because that's the only thing that really needed to be done. So the next chapter is talking about the poetry of steady light. And Bly says, quote, there are two kinds of non-leapers. And the one we just kind of talked about, there are very dull people. We didn't really discuss that, but a lot of writers, once again, are very dull. They don't really make these leaps and it takes a long time. And if they do it at all, it's very dull. There isn't these phantasms and these massive adjectives that they add to it. The copper mine contrasts the green radiating cell phone towers. That's something I just made up in my mind, but they don't even come close to touching weird stuff like that. And if they do, it's like super pretentious. So the other type of non leaper quote is another sort of po poetry is written by a poet who remains by choice for the time of a poem roughly in one part of the psyche. His poems give off a steady light. The leaping poetry poem, by contrast, gives off a constantly... Flashing life as it shifts from light psyche to dark psyche, resembling the flashing light of flying saucers. Okay, Robert. What is an example of a steady light poem? Here's one. As I was walking, I came upon chance walking the same road upon. As I sat down by chance to move late, and if as I might, light the wood was, light and green, and what I saw before I had not seen. It was a lady accompanied by goat men leading her. Her hair held earth. Her eyes were dark. A double flute made her move. Oh, love, where are you leading me now? One of the reasons Cridley does this is because his mind leaps so much during the day that in the poem, he tries to hold it in one place to stop the chaos. The danger of staying in one part of the psyche during a poem is that eventually you may lose touch with the more primitive, outward, sensual, dark areas. And if you look at this poem, there's nothing dark about this. This is like, the, the, you could see he's trying to constrain it, like Bly says. He's trying to hold it in. There are these, there's these no, there's no leaps, but there is this spiritual or magical sense to it and a lot of fantasy writers are very good at this this is like at some level what fantasy is is just like this kind of literature of steady light so Bly says that people like Shakespeare William Wordsworth these people are kind of those steady light poets and I could agree with that that when I read those poets it's not like they aren't they aren't making associations but most of the time they fall flat or they aren't deep enough as they could be so Bly really appreciates the European poets 
And he says that like the New York City poets act like they are jumping in their psych, but really they just jump from one place to an- one place in New York to another place in New York, and they and they stay there. They aren't jumping from Kansas to the Indian Ocean. And you could see this. I feel like a lot of the time there is a pretentiousness in the in the non leaping. A lot of these leapers think that they don't need to do it. And so what Bly is really advocating here is an understanding of the, he calls it the three different brains, but we could call it thought, emotion, and action, like the the, the trivium, like the classical, the, the trinity. And if you don't understand the intellect, the heart, and the body, you're going to have, at some level, no ability to create masterpiece poems. However, I should take that back, because if you are a master, like for instance, Chaucer, Bly says, is a master of the mammalian brain. I would agree. If you are a master of a certain aspect of one of those areas, and that is sometimes more than enough to carry you through, just polarizing yourself in that manner is important. And we all have our strengths and weaknesses. But I think always working on some of your weaknesses or understanding there's more aspects than just one can aid all of our poetry. So now I want to discuss probably, as I was talking about earlier, one of the greatest leaping poets of all time. And his name is Rainer Marie Rilke. So Rilke started off as just a typical poet and he was talented. He was moving his way through the world and being just a starving artist. But he then started to study under Rodin. And Rodin was considered one of the greatest sculptors of all time. And under some recommendations of some other people, Rodin, who wasn't a poet, didn't really understand poetry, started to help him understand art, though. And he prescribed what a lot of art students do now, and that is to just sit and look at something for a very long time. But this is much bigger than art, because this is a prescription for almost all shamanic religions. If we look at disconnected all across the world, Tibetan, um, South American, Central American, European, African, there's this prescription to go out into nature and to look at something for a very long time. For instance, like an animal or a thing. And if you stare at it enough and look at it enough and spend enough time with it, you'll start to understand its essence. And that's what Rodin made him do. He would make him look at famous artistic pieces in Europe and sit there and stare at it for hours or go to a zoo and look at a panther and start to understand it at a very deep level. And Rilke, who has this talent, started to learn to see because we don't see reality clearly. All of us have issues, not just with our awareness, but we have biases. We have all these things that are clouding an accurate perception of reality. And that's what the East talks about. The East is trying to bring people into becoming awake, into waking waking up. The sleeper must awaken. And when you do that, you don't see anything differently. You just see things for how they are. Rilke said in, in a poem that if you saw reality for what it really was perfectly, you would die. So Rilke starts to explore this. This is one of the first people to start to explore this. And this is very similar to, for instance, music, understanding scales, understanding the foundation elements of something. And so when he started to see and started to look, he created one side of the polarity of leaping because both sides need to be strong. So he's created an idea of conscious reality that was near perfect. He created this power over here. But then on the other side is the unconscious. And that's what he started to work on when he left Rodin. And he started to do this because he was a very weird and rambling individual. For instance, he wrote his greatest poems in a span of two weeks and, and a fury of writing all day, every day, and he was very, and, and this was, and he was very sickly and always trying to get over these ailments and was in a lot of pain all the time. And all that pain connected him to kind of that traumatic spirituality. Maybe we could call it that sad boy spirituality. But when you combine that with this ability to see, suddenly we get a Rilke who was amazing. And so we're going to be examining now some of his sonnets to Orpheus. And if you guys don't know, Orpheus is a very famous demigod or figure in Greek mythology. And he had a lyre. And when he played his lyre, he could seduce animals. He can make wild animals bow down to him and listen and um, not attack him because of how beautiful his music was. And just as a side note, a lot of poet, a lot of poetry has been corrupted, you could say, by this Orphic sense. I don't think it has been, but a lot of people, for instance, one of my professors, Donald Ravel, said that he doesn't want any Orphic stuff anymore. He doesn't want to seduce the animals. He just wants to be with the animals or see them from afar. And so this Orphic quality is also a very interesting thing that I would like to analyze at a future point. But let's read some of the sonnets to Orpheus right now. But that's important that he has, Orpheus has this ability to leap. He has this ability to create such beauty that it can tap into the unconscious of man and animal. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, the first sonnet. A tree rising, what a pure growing. Orpheus is singing, a tree inside the ear. Silence, silence. Yet new buildings, signals, and changes went on in the silence. Animals created by silence came forward from the clear and relaxed forest where the layers were, and it turned out the reason they were so full of silence was not cunning and not terror. It was listening. 
Growling, yelping, grunting now seemed all nonsense to them. And where, and where before there was hardly a shed where this listening could go, a rough shelter put up out of the brushy longings with an entrance gate whose poles were wobbly, you created a temple for them deep inside their ears. I mean, the power of this poem, it makes, make, makes me want to shed a tear, man. The reason animals were created by silence and the reason that they were grunting and so full of silence was because they were listening. And they come out of the forest and it all seems like nonsense when they hear Orpheus' lyre. They're like, what were we doing? Why were we doing that? Excuse me, the, the silence that they were experiencing was because they heard the lyre and they were so full of silence because of that. And they were never able to listen and they never had a shed to be able to listen. Now, but however, however, Orpheus has now created a temple for them to listen. In. Really good stuff, man. I mean, really innovative stuff for for the time period so let's try another one number three a god can do it but tell me how could a man follow his in intricate road through the strings a man is split and where two roads intersect inside of us no one has built the singer's temple writing poetry as we learn from you is not desiring not wanting something that we can, that can never be achieved to write poetry is to be alive for a god that's easy when however are we really alive? And when does he turn the earth and the stars so they face us? Yes, you are young and you love and the voice forces your mouth open. That's lovely. But learn to forget that breaking into song, it doesn't last. Real singing is a different movement of air. Air moving around nothing. A breathing in a God. I mean, that's some fire. That's a creative writing lesson 101. That is everything that Buddhism in the East has always said. Yes, you're young and you like to talk. That's great. But that doesn't last. Real singing is air breathing. Okay, let's try one more. Only the man who has raised his strings among the dark ghosts also can sense it and give the everlasting praise. Only he who has eaten poppy within, with the dead from their poppy will never lose even his most delicate sound. Even though images in the pool seem so blurry, grasp the main thing. Only in the double kingdom. There alone do voices become beautiful, really beautiful stuff. So now let's, you know, now that we're here, now that I got you, if you've made it this far, thank you. I know we're reading poetry and having a good time, but let's read one of Robert Bly's poems. I know some of you guys are new to Robert Bly, so I want to show you one of his poems, and he's so good at this. I mean, he, Robert Bly wrote the greatest anti-war poetry of all ever. He brought in so much symbology and energy to protest the Civil War at the peak of his powers, at the peak of his poetry, in my opinion, the peak of American poetry, that any goober today writing poetry about like, they're, they're killing us and our life suck. And like, dude, they can't even, they don't even understand. So I don't know what, I don't even know what this poem is by Bly, but we're going to read it. And almost all of his stuff is really good. There are fears that come up from underneath. Bushes moving where there is no wind. Christ bound on a burning wheel. Do not be afraid. The sun hidden by great insects. A snake curled around the flower jar on the grave. So many die mad, knocking over chairs. The battle we can lose, maybe have already lost. Numbness, nothingness, paralysis. The hawks will dive on us. The mother hawk will come. We will be taken, eaten in a valley. Bones scattered, hair thrown into the wind. In that age, no one can save himself. The savior himself caught in a magnetic field struggling against his swaddling bands. There are fears coming up from underneath, pulling us down. The ecstatic orifices closed to the blue stormlight. Antires and the orphic nests swirled in the surd rivers. The outer eighth inch of the brain giving off smoke, like mist boiling off hail clouds. I am afraid. The insubstantial body stretched out 10 miles long in the sixth dimension. The death birds flying along the corridors we make for them without, with our own bodies after death. Chips rising and falling. No way. Oh, bro, no. Cut it, man. This Look at some of this. There are fear. I mean, this, th just these five, seven lines right here. Indulge me, man. This is, this is wild. There are fears. Look at, look at the contrast here. Look at the sentence structure and the contrast and the contrast within the contrast and how he's layering it. There are fears coming up from the underneath, pulling us down. The ecstatic moving up where orifices closed to the blue storm, like ec ecstatic open, but closed. Antires and the Orphic Ness swirled in the sword rivers. Oh my gosh, a beautiful verbs here. The outer eighth inch of the brain giving off smoke like mist boiling off hail clouds. I mean, this is 
Like I said, if you just look at the verb usage, this there is association, there is movement. I am afraid. So this really concludes my analysis of leaping poetry. We're going to continue with our Robert Bly journey. As you just heard from that poem, he is fire, man. Like there is stuff like that. Imagine poems like that, but even better, protesting the Vietnam War. Like get out of here. All right, so if you have any questions about leaping poetry, commentary, feedback, criticism, whatever, leave it down below. If you want me to go into this even deeper, I actually have another video where I did on this topic a while back. It wasn't really on this book, but it was just kind of inspired by themes in this book and I made it randomly. It's right over here. I, I think it's a pretty good video if you kind of want to go deeper and hear a different perspective of this. But if you've had enough of me in this concept, I'll see you in another videos. Peace out.